Hello, uh, my name is Sue Kelso. I'm one of the co-founders of the Good Heart Artist Residency. This interview is the second in a series of alumni artist interviews that we, we will be doing this year as we celebrate our 10th year of hosting creative people in Good Heart. Megan Kelso Kellner will be interviewing alumni artist Lindsay Dunnigan, and we will tour Lindsay's studio space. Lindsay was the second artist uh, that we hosted in collaboration with Cricketry Art Center in Petoskey in the summer of 2014. I'll get things started and then turn things over to Megan and Lindsay for the interview. Okay, first, it's really important that we start by thanking our many volunteers, our donors, our partnering organizations, our board of directors, and the organizations shown here that support us in this artist residency work. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna take you back in time. This is nine and a half years ago um, when Lindsay was a resident for a two week stay in August of 2014. Um, we like to take residents um, out and show them the area too. So scenes of taking her to Legs Inn and on the far right is a craft project that she did with a, with a neighbor. Uh, during Lindsay's stay, uh, obviously she did a lot, made a lot of art. Um, we also invited the community in, um, had an open studio. They came in and they met Lindsay and got to see her work and hear about her process. And she also did a artist talk at Cricketry Art Center in Petoskey. And just a few more Im images of Lindsay out and enjoying Northwest Michigan. Okay, and the artwork itself. So um, this is Lindsay's artwork, uh, the two on the left. Um, talk about those a little bit. The bottom one, Lindsay really enjoyed um, the odd shaped carrots out of my garden. And she incorporated those in one of her paintings uh, as a layer in one of her paintings. The image above is a piece of work that we purchased from an alumni art show at Cricketry Art Center about four or five years ago that Lindsay had made. And in that image, we see what looks like fishing nets and it reminded us of land and water. And the artist residency itself is located on ancestral lands of the Adawa people. And they were fishermen, artisans, and traders in this area, really connected to the land and water. So we purchased this, this piece because it really reminded us of the history of the area. The largest piece is a more um, recent work of Lindsay's and she'll be talking a lot about her process in the, in the interview. So I'm gonna introduce the two of them and then I will, turn it over to them. So Lindsay Dunnigan is currently living, working, and making art in Kirksville, Missouri. She's an associate professor of art at Truman State University. Um, Lindsay, I followed your work on social media, and I have to say I was super excited to see your work once when going through an airport. Um, I don't remember which airport it was now, but we were super excited to see your work after your residency pop up in a public space like that. Mm -hmm. So we also have a copy of your children's book that you wrote and illustrated, The Best Cheese. So Lindsay, can you just give us a quick, just say a quick hello so the screen jumps over to you? Yeah, hello. Okay, thank you. So Megan Kelso Kellner is an artist, a Good Heart board member, and a visiting professor at Grand Valley State University. Megan will be interviewing Lindsay. So thank you to both of you for Zooming with us so that we can share this with the public and they can catch up with your work, Lindsay. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Megan for the interview. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, Lindsay, I'm really excited to talk with you and hear more about the work that you've been making. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll kind of start there. A lot of change can happen uh, in your work over, you know, nine and a half years. Um, so could you tell us just what have you been up to recently and what's something that you're working on right now that you're excited about? Yeah. So I guess I would say when I first did the residency, I was exploring mapping because I was really interested in how the world looked from above. You know, I spent my childhood going back and forth between Alaska, where I grew up and where my dad still lives, and then Texas, where my mom moved. And so the flight going from these two big states across quite a lot of distance provided just such um, fascinating visuals while, you know, looking out the plane window and going between these two people that were essential to my nuclear family. Um, and so I was thinking about how, uh, you know, my nuclear family was split and these like valleys and rivers and mountain ranges were kind of physically between them as well. And so that was a big part of my artwork and what I was exploring for a really long time. 
Um, and then my artwork really changed when I moved to Missouri to take the position of professor um, of fine art at Truman State University running the painting program. And what I had here in, in Kirksville, Missouri that I didn't have in Texas was just a huge amount of access to nature. And so my work just really started to reflect my ability to be immersed in nature you know, daily. Um, I made a whole bunch of drawings um, and paintings about the landscape that were kind of also about my grandmother who had Alzheimer's and this in-between space. So they were like pretty dark. Um, and then, and then after a while, I just, I kind of went back to childhood, but in a different way. It, and it was more like a freeing fun process of going back instead of thinking about the split between my family, thinking about, um, how fun it was to be in this Alaskan landscape that was just so magnificent, so vast and also manipulatable. And so I started creating paintings like the one behind me, uh, where it's actually more of a, a landscape memory as opposed to a real space. So I'm, I had this, this huge archive of photos that I took when I was young. Uh, my dad really encouraged photography. So I just like snapped photos all the time. And I just have all these printed photos and bags. And I just layer the landscape, um, then blow things up and then shrink things down. This is a glacier down here. And so it becomes sort of this um, impossible space at, that could only exist in memory. And then I started to abstract the landscape even further um, by cutting it up. And so here's one example of that. It might be a little hard to see on your screen, but you can see I'm taking fish nets, uh, sterling silver leaf, and then you can see inside uh, that's actually a painting that I cut up and also applied sterling silver leaf onto as well. But there, there are mountains um, and lakes referenced in this work, it's really abstract. So I'm, I'm doing the layering here with oil and then I'm doing it with paper, watercolor, silver leaf. And then the one thing I'm working on right now in this moment is just a massive installation um, and it's fabric actually. So, you know, I consider myself mostly a two-dimensional artist, but uh, my ideas have started to make their way into the three-dimensional realm, especially installation art. And so what I'm doing right now is just this absolutely massive installation of uh, multiple fabric walls that are basically this, but you can walk through it. So you can physically interact with the, with the fabric. And the oh, idea wow. behind that was just an ability to play with the media, manipulate your landscape, similar to the way I felt, you know, in the winter in Alaska, after it snowed a whole lot, you could make anything you wanted out of that snow. You could dig tunnels, you could build, you know, massive structures, and it just felt like a playground, but this physical space that existed um, outside. Oh, cool. What an exciting leap to switch into three dimensions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, I've been, uh, I was curious about the mountains behind you as you're speaking, because I know Kirksville is such a, um, like more of a plains type area. So mm -hmm. it's two totally different types of landscape. Um, I'm curious about um, some of the materials that you use too. I know that you've done um, like used a lot of surfaces that are sort of like a regular and organic um, and, and use a lot of things like netting and um, silver and gold. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about kind of what's led you to some of uh, your material choices. I do think that a lot of my artistic process is, um, I mean, it's a lot of it's related to nostalgia and also the, the idea that home is this like special glittering, glittering place that exists in memory. And that is, um, you can never really go back to. Um, and so to represent that, that I think that's where the metallic stuff comes in, like the real 24 karat gold that I use um, in some of my drawings, the real sterling silver, it feels precious. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's also a nod to the idea that um, by remembering the past in such a, such a loving way, I'm also reinventing it because nothing is that perfect. Um, but there's something fun about it as well. I think we all have a lot of nostalgia. <laughs> What was your other question? Sorry, I think, I don't know if I answered everything. No, yeah, you touched on it. Just um, curious about uh, some of the materials that you're using. Um, and I'd noticed kind of the continuation through your work. I mean, now with what's behind you, but even some of your pre previous work too, with that sort of like irregular organic surface that you, that you work on. 
For me, the organic surface is memory. Um, I mean, I guess a rectangular square could serve as a portal, but I think we don't really notice rectangular, rectangular or square paintings because um, that's how we expect them to be. So when they're on a shaped substrate, it's sort of like, okay, I'm not just noticing the interior of the painting, but the exterior as well. Yeah. And so the exterior of this painting, for example, is referencing a mountain and also a glacier. You can kind of see that echoed in, in the way that it's painted. Um, and the shape you notice, and so it's sort of like like a like a chunk out of out of that time period, and we're we're getting to see into the past, like a portal. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, you're in your your studio space inside your home. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, just sort of an average studio session looks like for you? Yeah, they're always different um, depending upon you know what I'm pursuing, but I have a whole bunch of white folding tables and this studio space that I'm in is really flexible. I I bought a house in uh I think it was 2021 and you know at that time I was single and I didn't have any pets and so I basically just used the whole house for my art especially when I had a big project coming up. Now my life is a little more complicated. I have some pets and uh a partner um and so I I, I still have one room that I use as my studio, and this is the space that I really fill with art when I need to get busy. It's a flexible space, so everything is it's pretty easy for everything to move around however I need it to be. Um, right now, I'm working in two spaces, so I'm working in this space, and also my university has a really large fiber studio. Um, and so right now, today, I was actually at work all day um, in that fiber studio. Uh, sewing. And so there's sort of less stuff here, but I can, I can show you the space and you can kind of see how flexible it is. So sure. I'll just kind of turn you around. Um, you can see one of my folding tables there. <laughs> and then that's the backyard. Um, yeah. So it's not gigantic, but it's, like I said, it's very flexible. It's a nice little space. And then if I want to, I can definitely still go into other rooms in the house. Um, but that's for projects when I run out of room and, and that hasn't happened for a while. So. Nice to have the freedom to be able to take over. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, I mean, if um, you want to learn more about my current project, I could show you a video that talks about the process and it also actually shows both studios and how they're used in different ways. Um, that show is going to open March 21st. And once that happens, I'll be able to take a break from sewing and maybe get back to painting, <laughs> but I'm pretty immersed in, in that right now. Yeah, that would be great. I think it'd be great to see that. Made to be 
the cloud Oh, passing back beyond by my darling Your eyes, I'll bring the night Singing in the light That couldn't let it go Doing justice to my own I too been a fault finder But that life is broke Now I love you Oh, you're the one my heart chose And so watching you work that process is just so physical does it does it feel different I mean I, I mean of course it feels different kind of working in that way but are there like challenges that feel unique to working with fibers or working like with these large pieces of material um you know for some reason I um most of my work is actually very physical so even these like just hauling them around. And, you know, I mean, I still do the map paintings, actually. I, I didn't mention that. But it's it's an ongoing project for me. And sometimes, I mean, one of my map paintings, I think last year or the year before was like, I think it was 20 feet by 10 feet or some, something. And so I, I had to do that in my garage. And I was like lifting these giant pieces of plexiglass. And then I had to make a a crate and then like we had to put it on a semi truck <laughs> so yeah for some reason I I keep going back to just absolutely giant physical projects um and luckily I like yoga so that helps but not always. <laughs> I mean I definitely have like some body aches that I have to work out <laughs> from it awesome yeah um yeah, I wanted to ask you about too. I know that you've uh, been working on some children's books that you have, um, uh, one that you've done already and and have, I think, a couple more that you're working on. Yeah, that's just um, something that I've always wanted to do ever since I was young. I always wanted to write and illustrate children's books. And I had been working on my writings for a long time, but um, didn't quite know what to do about the process. And, you know, during the pandemic, we were stuck at home and I just thought, I'm going to just go for it and figure it out. So I did write and illustrate the book called The Best Cheese. And I self-published that one. It was really, really helpful uh, just to learn how everything works. Um, and now I'm, I joined a, a, a group called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And I'm going to their first in-person conference, I think, since the pandemic hit. And that's going to be February 10th uh, in New York. I'm really excited about that. So I have two more children's books that I just received sabbatical to uh, to illustrate. So I'm going to be spending all next year doing that. Um, and I finished my first illustration for it, actually. So it's just, it's like really whimsical, but um just some kids who get lost in the woods and, and just the, 
sort of magical adventures that they run into. Uh, it's about siblings, their relationship, a complicated relationship they have with their parents, and then just um, the magical stuff found in nature. Uh, it's, you know, I think when, when your artwork is dealing with kind of tough concepts, children's mm -hmm. books can be a really delightful outlet for something um, that's maybe a little bit more playful than my traditional work tends to be. Uh, but then at the same time, like I'm finding that that these children's books also deal with serious concepts. And so, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's been really nice to, to do, to have a, a serious art practice in my studio and then to have something that feels like a little bit more free and um, playful as this children's books, uh, this children's book outlet. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Congrats on your sabbatical. That'll be an exciting project to dig really deeply into. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, well, I guess kind of last but not least, I kind of wanted to just ask you um, about uh, what role um, either like the Good Heart Residency or other like, you know, opportunities to um, kind of like, like your sabbatical coming up, delve kind of deep into your process, what role that's played um, for you and um, any impact that that's had on, on your practice. Yeah, so I've done a couple residencies. Good Heart was definitely an amazing, amazing experience. I feel like I was really spoiled. That was my first residency. And, you know, Sue had all this, these like beautiful food arrangements and like I had a stocked fridge and it was just amazing. And um, the space was beautiful to work in the landscape and then meeting all the people in Petoskey um, and also in Good Heart. So yeah, just, you know, for most of my life, I have not really needed space to create create art because, like I said, I've like pretty much just lived alone, and so I could make whatever space I was living in. Um, I could turn that into a studio. I mean, I did have roommates, of course, for like my college years and a little bit after, but um, even then, I could usually carve out some space, and especially once I started living on my own. Um, but so for me residencies aren't really about the space. It's really more about the opportunity to expand your mind in a way that's different. You know, sometimes new locations will generate new ideas and new challenges. And then also the opportunity to meet other people who are artists um, or curators, because often they come together in these interesting residency spaces. You'll meet just all sorts of neat people. And that definitely happened when I was in Good Heart. There was just a lot of creative people that I was able to come in contact with. So that was really neat too. And then the garden, I remember just being so inspired <laughs> by Sue's garden, <laughs> which is why I made that carrot painting. <laughs> um, yeah. So just opportunities like that just feel so supportive to artists and um, it's a really great way to network and, and then also to think about your work a little differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think um I think that's all the questions that I had for you. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you wanted to share? Um no, I think that's it. You know, I, if if anyone happens to be in the area in March, I hope they can come to the show at Truman. <laughs> but that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Um what space at Truman is the show going to be in, Lindsay? What what space? Um, Truman has two galleries and my show is going to be in what's called the Charlin Gallery, which is the smaller of the two. And so it's going to just fill the entire gallery. It'll, the whole gallery will be this um, fabric installation. And actually the, the model that you saw is the same size as the gallery. And so it'll look just like that. Cool. Oh, that's so exciting. All right. Well, it was it was great to see the video of you actually doing this the work, and it is a lot of work, but such beauty comes out of it. So just wow, wonderful to see that. And uh, thank you for your time. And I just wish you all the best on your sabbatical. And I look forward to you visiting Good Heart in September when we do our ten year celebration. So that'll be wonderful. Yeah, I'm so excited to come to that. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, before I end the whole thing, I want to want everybody to know that our next program is actually in March, and it's a panel of four writers. They're going to share writing that was inspired by being in Good Heart. So four writers will read some of their work and have a, a panel discussion, and that'll be a live 
um, Zoom that we'll put the link to the Zoom out soon so that uh, you can join us in March for that. So thank you, thank you, and take care. Thank you so much.